We're on the, the, the entire World Wide Web can see us. That's incredible. All right. Well, uh, hello to our friends in Kazakhstan, for starters, and in Vietnam. Thanks uh, all for coming. In uh, 1948, Winston Churchill, in his uh, History of the Second World War, wrote the following. I won't read all six volumes, by the way, just a paragraph. Okay. It is my purpose, wrote Churchill, as one who lived and acted in those days to show how easily the tragedy of the Second World War could have been prevented, how the malice of the wicked was reinforced by the weakness of the virtuous, how the structure and habits of democratic states, unless they are welded into larger organisms, lack those elements of persistence and conviction, which alone can give security to humble masses, how even in matters of self-preservation, no policy is pursued for even 10 or 15 years at a time. We shall see how the councils of prudence and restraint may become the prime agents of mortal danger, how the middle course adopted from desires for safety and a quiet life may be found to lead direct to the bullseye of disaster. It's an appropriate passage for beginning this talk, uh, and I welcome you to this book talk uh, on the Honorable Chuck DeBoer's latest book, Crisis of the House Never United. Uh, I expect all of you to jump on your phones and order a copy, although if you're here in person, there's copies outside. So if you're on the internet, uh, it's available uh, anywhere. I'm going to put the sales pitch up front. Uh, I don't have any fiscal relationship with Chuck, except that he, he works in the office across from me, but it is a very, very good book. If you don't know who the Honorable Chuck DeVore is, my longtime friend, uh, he is the currently the Chief National Initiatives Officer at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He writes on the economy, on energy, on tax, on the Constitution, on federalism, and nearly everything under the sun, always with an eye toward liberty and prosperity that is our proper due as Americans and Texans. But he is not a native Texan. He is a Texan by choice. For many years, Chuck served as an assemblyman in the great state, once great state of California, which will be great again when Chuck's ideas once again find purchase in their native land. He was termed out in 2010. Uh, otherwise, I presume you would be governor uh, at this point and uh, represented almost 500,000 people in the California State Assembly, a senior assistant to a U.S. congressman from 88 to 90. Uh, that's in the past century for the Gen Zers who were watching. Uh, and in the Reagan era Pentagon, uh, Chuck was the special assistant for foreign affairs. Prior to his election to public office, Chuck was also an executive in the aerospace industry for 13 years, analyzing technology and corporate capabilities and working in business development. But perhaps most significant uh, in his annals of service, uh, which are robust and extensive uh, toward the American public, uh, he is a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army Reserve, having served in both the National Guard and the Reserve. Uh, Chuck has written this book on the founding era, which we're going to discuss today. And I wanna to emphasize to all of you who are both here and watching that there is no better man to write this book. There is no one who has thought in my personal experience more deeply and extensively about how the American experiment went right and where it could have gone wrong. So with that, uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Chuck DeVore. Thank you, Josh. Guess I need to buckle my seatbelt now. Yeah, no, no, you do. Uh, you have to live up to all that. Uh, so, 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 look. I mean, let, let's let's start at the beginning. This is not your first book. You wrote a book, uh, and remind me of the year: two thousand two, two thousand three. It was uh, published first in uh, two thousand. Uh, I had researched it in ninety eight and wrote most of it in ninety nine. Okay, okay. My my, my son uh, recently asked me how we did things in the nineteen hundreds. Uh, so this was this was a book from the nineteen hundreds, but but it too was kind of in the same genre. It was called China Attacks, as you mentioned, and it was about a hypothetical, increasingly less hypothetical uh, communist Chinese attack uh, upon the island of Taiwan, uh, which I think we can say uh, in this company, you know, is is properly understood as an independent state. Um, uh, but it was an alt history, and you've chosen to write now another alternate history. Alternate history, good alternate history, presupposes the author's grasp of actual history. Tell me what you find valuable in the alt history genre. Well, Josh, it, I think it allows us to think about things in a disciplined and ordered way. Uh, things didn't have to be the way they are now, right? There are uh, random events, you know, like the butterfly effect or people, agency. Uh, things could have gone one way and they went the other. Uh, and it allows you to kind of uh, dig into what were the issues driving things at the time. You had technology, you had politics, you had personal relations, you even have weather conditions and things like that, that all for 
uh, those things working together, things could have ended up a, a lot differently. And that same process um, of th that I use to kind of think about these things are things that I was trained as an army intelligence officer to be able to analyze, okay, here's the terrain, here's the weather conditions, here's the enemy force, here's the equipment they have, their doctrine, how they fight. Uh, as an intelligence officer, that you're doing that all the time. And, uh, and we've applied it here at the foundation a couple of times as well. Uh, we did uh, two uh, kind of war games or simulations, uh, as, as they might be called in the civilian world. Uh, we did one in December of 2020 called the Biden Border Crisis that predicted all the stuff that's going on now. And that I, I think you were on that team. We had two yeah. dozen people. We had retired uh, military officers. We had reti uh, U.S. attorneys. We had academics from Mexico City. We had former members of Congress that were part of this team. Uh, looking ahead, what is going to happen when Biden takes office? And right. we also did a similar thing for the election in, in 2020 and published that in, I think, September. Uh, that predicted a lot of what what happened during the election process. And and and, and on the you know on the first one on the Biden border crisis, I have to say uh, I was disappointed that as soon as I sent in, in my role as a player, as soon as I sent the Texas Rangers into Mexico, the umpire stopped the game. <laughs> yes, you'll get your chance someday. We didn't get to the good part, yeah. uh, but but on on the second one, I thought it was very interesting because of course you know as as you say this kind of speculative exercise, uh, both post facto and and uh, I guess pre facto is not a phrase, but you know in in the future speculation. Uh, is is so incredibly useful, and the press that reported upon the election exercise, uh, one hundred percent failed to understand the importance of it. They, uh, in fact, it was reported in some cases. You can tell us about this as as coup plotting, basically. Right, yeah. Right. Well, all we were trying to do was to understand what does the Constitution say about the election process, and to take it to its absolute in conclusion. In other words, if everything that the founders anticipated could go wrong went wrong, what would it look like? What were the time hacks? You know, what days would uh, something occur? How would it happen? What were the legal precedents, if any? And trying to get people to think ahead so that they, so that in the eye of the storm or as the crisis was upon them, they would at least have some work that helped them think about, oh, well, well, I guess we need to start thinking about this thing next. Right, right. right. Well, I think that's a great segue then, uh, because, you know, you look forward to what could go wrong, possibly in the election process, much of which actually did uh, in the 2020 cycle. Um, but then with your book, you, you, we rewind effectively two and a half centuries, a little less than two and a half centuries to the founding era of the United States. Tell us about, uh, you know, we'll get to some spoilers in the book. Uh, you should still buy the book. Um, but uh, t tell us about the premise of, of the book, please. Right. So the, the premise is, is really pretty simple. Um, in the few years after the revolution, America, which never, by the way, had a lot in the way of hard currency, right? That's one of the reasons why we were using bits of eight, right? The uh, pieces of the, the Spanish silver dollar cut into yes. eights, right? Uh, that's where you get two bits uh, equals a quarter. That's right. right? Yeah. Uh, and so what had happened was you had a lot of the, the state governments that had a lot of debt that they had built up from the Revolutionary War, uh, and they needed to pay that debt. Uh, and at the same time, a lot of the farmers up in New England had gone into debt to put more acreage under the plow, because when General Cornwallis, who was a very capable British general, went south, he was burning a lot of the crops uh, in the south. And so America needed food. So the farmers of New England responded in that rocky glacial soil of theirs with the terrible growing conditions, and they started growing more food. Well, then the war ends, commodity prices plummet. They have bills to pay. They not only have mortgages on their farms, but they have hard taxes now that they got to pay to Boston. That's right. And so the problem then arose where a militia captain by the name of Shays decided he had enough because he was seen as neighbors' farms be foreclosed upon. And let's emphasize this is still real history. We're, this is real history, yes, right? right. Uh, and so they rose up in rebellion as the Bostonian kind of elite, the, the traders and the merchants there in Boston, were demanding uh, hard currency to pay taxes. And so what they started to do is they started to lay siege to courthouses and preventing the foreclosing procedures from going forward, in some cases, burning the records within the courthouses. Uh, and then th this movement kind of accelerated, and it got to the point where the people in Boston actually hired their own 3,000-man private army 
being led by Benjamin Lincoln, a Civil War veteran and, and hero, yes. to go crush the farmers' revolt. And so all that happened in real life. And so the departure in my book is that Shea's rebellion is a little more violent than it really was. And the reprisals against it, led by Governor Bowdoin, who was a hardliner, he took over from uh, Hancock, uh, who saw things coming and kind of uh, slinked away and allowed someone else to take the hit. And this is the Bowdoin of modern day real world Bowdoin College. Correct. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so things are a little bit more violent in terms of the reprisals. And that sets in motion a chain of events that ends up stalling and preventing the ratification of the Constitution because it was actually a really closely fought effort. It's interesting to me, uh, you know, one of the details that you mentioned, uh, again, in the real timeline, that it's 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 Benjamin Lincoln, who uh, who is the one who's called out to suppress or to lead the forces that suppress Shays Rebellion. Uh, and this is one of the, I think, one of the wonderful details in the book and having gotten to talk to you while you were researching and writing the book. Uh, I didn't realize Lincoln had anything like a military career after the fall of Charleston right. uh, in 1780, which was the greatest single defeat inflicted upon the Continental Army in the course of the entire American Revolution. Uh, to talk to me a little bit about that process, because you, you, you mentioned several times that you, you just unearthed things that really spoke to the premise that you were working for, the contingency of it, but also the continuity of a lot of the actors uh, who continue to reappear in the post-revolutionary era in right. surprising ways. Well, first of all, I have to say that, um, and, and I don't know, maybe this uh, r will ruin it for some people, but this sort of research for me, as someone who's a generalist and a former politician and a military veteran and all that, I'm not a historian, right? This is a project that 30 years ago, prior to the internet as it exists now, you probably would have had to have 20 good years of hard research to be able to pull all this together. And, and an amazing amount of notes that you'd have to cross-reference by hand and everything else. Now it's so easy to be able to pull threads and to say, okay, you know, we know a lot about Aaron Burr. Who was he interacting with? Who was he friends with? Who, who were his rivals? Uh, where was he living? What sort of things was he doing at the time to earn a living? Uh, and as you begin to connect these threads and having run for office successfully and knowing kind of how politicians work and knowing how militaries work, uh, you can begin to tell a story about what it must have been like to be one of those players back then, who they were interacting with, the cadence. Obviously, there's no telegraph, right? Uh, one of the things that was interesting, and, and you might get a kick out of this, I had to revise the book in a few areas. Uh, I've ridden horses a moderate amount in my life. Uh, and I remember very clearly going out once with a descendant or a relative of Wild Bill Cody, who was uh, someone who lived near where I did and taking his horses out. And he was, I asked him, well, how far could a horse go in a day? He says, oh, we, we generally don't like to push them more than 15 or 20 miles. Well, I remember this. This was like 1977 when he told me this. And so I put in my timeline, like, okay, if Burr sets out on horse to go from point A to point B, how long is it going to take him? Mm. Well, then I find out a few weeks later that the horses we have today are like, pampered luxury items compared to the way the horses were used back in the 1780s they went 50 miles in a day yeah and so then i had to go back and revise several points in my text the timelines because i was trying to be as accurate as possible as i was with the uh the conditions of the weather for example i would always look if it was a nighttime scene i'd always go back and i would look up what was the phase of the moon at that night in that day of history yeah, because that's important to me as an intelligence guy. We pay attention to stuff like that. Right, right. No, it's part of the opboard uh, format. It, it, it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, my, my sons and I are currently uh, doing the uh, doing the long march through the Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, and uh, and at the end, uh, you know, Almanzo Wilder does not put the horse up in the barn until they've gone about fifty to sixty miles during the day. Which is fascinating. So we obviously need to talk more while you're writing books. Yeah. Uh, but but you know that that actually you know brings in something, and that ability to synthesize brings in something. I'll push back a little bit uh, on you, um, uh, which I say with love. Uh, you're a historian. Uh, you know you know when we look at what we think about uh, historians these days and kind of the credentialed historian class, a lot of the PhD holders, a lot of the academics, uh, and 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 now don't misunderstand me. I'd love to have a PhD. 
But, uh, you know, there are uh, academics and PhD holders in academic history right now who do a terrible job at history. We've seen it happen over and over and over again. Uh, and so and so one thing I want to just posit to you is that is that what you've done and this work in general, whomever does it, uh, is the work of history. And, and what's required, and I think this is what's great about the historical discipline, uh, is, is simply a decent humanities education and the ability to intellectually synthesize. Will you accept that correction from me? <laughs> I will not. Uh, I, I I will not go against the moderator. Okay, that's always a good call. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of the book and uh, and kind of how you've got your cast of characters out. You're starting with with people in the real world. You do have a fictional character uh, I do. Who, who pops up right at the beginning, who's sort of the the protagonist through whom we see events unfold. Uh, he's very well crafted. Uh, but of course, you know, one of the joys of reading a book like this is that you actually get to read about individuals who you know existed in history and kind of gauge, you know, according to your idea of them or what they actually did, the author's sense of how they would behave in new situations. It's really fun to see. Um, at the centerpiece, I think of your of your villains, uh, you know, rogues gallery. He's not the only one, but he's certainly at the apex of it. Is the figure of Aaron Burr, who Aaron Burr at this point is uh, sort of the the evil Superman of the founding era. I think you know when we look at any any founding, um, you know, kind of especially in this past century, any sort of founding era. Uh, uh, text is going to have Aaron Burr as the guy who's pushing for uh, a devolved and evil America. I'm overstating it, but really not by much. Chernow's Hamilton, the actual Hamilton Broadway play, uh, now your book. Uh, it's notable that the only real defense of Aaron Burr that's ever been penned, uh, not by Burr himself, uh, is is by Gore Vidal, who who, who also hates America. Right. Uh, and so and so, you know, you know, tell me a little bit though about what makes Burr so compelling to you as a historical figure. I, I you know, I, I start with the supposition, which I think is accurate, that he was a genius, um, but uh, he was an unmoored one. Tell me, tell me a little bit about him. So it, it's Aaron Burr. It's people like Aaron Burr is the reason why we have the Constitution as a safeguard for liberty. So Burr was incredibly ambitious. He was an amazing politician. He was the one when the, the founding era founders thought that politics and campaigning were beneath them, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, none of these people campaigned for president in the way we think of today. That was all beneath them. You, you weren't, that was untoward. You weren't supposed to do that. Well, for Aaron Burr, no, this, this was like, Hey, I'm going to I'm going to get people I'm going to be a kingmaker. I'm going to roll people roll up my sleeves and make this happen. And so the thing that I find interesting is you have Tammany Hall, which was just a society uh in uh, kind of a weird one, but a society in New York, and Aaron Burr uses the framework of Tammany Hall to create a political machine that ends up lasting what 80 years or so. Yeah. Um so so he creates this machine to help get people elected. And so when you look at Burr's genius in politics, uh, I think it was Jefferson who said of Burr, you know, I've never met a man so great in the small things and so small in the great things. Uh, well, you know, be careful of such people because they can get a lot done and they're very ambitious. And that's the reason why we have a constitution where, uh, as the founder said, ambition checks ambition. Uh, you have to have these co-equal branches where even if you had... Uh, the entire branch filled with Aaron Burr-like people, as long as the constitutional framework was intact, then then you could survive because each branch would be zealously guarding their own authority against the other branches. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I'm extremely concerned that in today's day and age, as you've seen the U.S. Congress continually abdicate its authority into empower unelected bureaucrats in the administrative state that we're seeing this breakdown of the uh, checks and balances that our founders put in place in, in instead a creation of a unitary state wherein people like Aaron Burr could be absolutely deadly. And 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 you you start the book actually. This is not a spoiler uh, unless you haven't read the first page. <laughs> uh, uh, but you, you start the book with the consequences, a dramatic consequence of that breakdown. The book actually opens with uh, Burr presiding over the execution of uh, I believe Schuyler J and uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, right. if I remember correctly, which is you know you know shocking. So so whatever timeline we're in, Burr does kill Hamilton. Like, right, like that's the one. That's the one, like fixed point in time uh, that we have, and it does happen on the same day. It happens the on the, uh, oh, oh, I didn't realize that. 
and the, the Weehawken duo. I know. See, just <laughs> layers upon layers. Uh, that's why you should read Chuck's book. You'll discover things that I haven't. Uh, uh, so, 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 but that happens. Uh, uh, is that, and you know, this what you what you illustrate there, uh, and not just there, but but throughout the book, is the is the end of the uh, what I'll call the anti-Republican, smaller Republican, the anti-Republican critique of the late. 18th century, early 19th century, which is that this is the inevitable end to Republican and Democratic self-governance. Uh, talk to me a little bit about right. that, what you wanted to show. So again, it goes back to this concept of rule uh, by democracy, rule by, um, in this case, demagogues who are able to whip up popular support. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of resentment uh, certainly today, perhaps even more so back then, of people who didn't have a lot in the way of property or uh, uh, cash, right, towards the very small number of people who were uh, the elite that ran the country. In fact, John Jay said on several occasions, variations of the following, those who own, own the country ought to rule it. And that seems shocking to us today when you think of John Jay. I mean, this is one of the founders, one of the writers of the Federalist Papers, U.S. Supreme Court, you know, governor of New York. Um, those who own the country ought to, ought, to, ought to rule it, right? And so, and so in response to that, you had this undercurrent, which you saw with Shays' Rebellion, mm -hmm. where things threatened to get out of hand very much as they did a few years later in the French Revolution, which quickly devolved into the reign of terror and the guillotining of a lot of people, including people who were in favor of the revolution to begin with. The revolution started to eat its own. In fact, Thomas Paine, uh, who burned a lot of bridges in America, but who helped the revolution become an accomplished fact through his pamphlets, he went to France and ended up helping the revolution, and he almost got guillotined. That's right, yeah. And so, uh, and and he ends up as an ideologue of Burr's uh, uh, you know, quasi Confederacy in the North. He 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 does, although although he begins to after having seen things go wrong in France, he starts to have second uh, uh, thoughts about it, and uh, uh, unfortunately, that attracts Burr's uh, malevolent attention. Yes, yeah, I I find the idea of Thomas Paine having any measure of self doubt to be the only implausible thing. <laughs> Let's talk. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the that that those. So so what we're left with in the absence of the constitutional safeguards is really the rule of the great man, right? Right. Uh, and so and so founding era America had a great many great men. On the other side of Burr and his machinations, you have some very familiar figures. It's Jefferson, uh, abetted by uh, in, in in a not too surprising alliance, I think, when you consider the the real world characters of the men. John Adams. Talk talk right. to me a little bit about the opposing coalition. So what ends up happening is um, Burr, working with Governor Clinton of, of New York, uh, sees that after Shea's rebellion, um, that they really needed to take care of some of the irritants that almost led to the, the ratification of the Constitution. And so what New York ends up doing is they raise their tariffs and they share some of the tariff money with Connecticut and with New Jersey which was two of the places that passed the Constitution right away, right. largely because they were completely dependent on imports that came in through New York, that New York got to tax and they didn't get any of the money from. So, so Burr is trying to put the genie back in the bottle and making sure that ratification doesn't go forward. Uh, and then he realizes that, hey, you know, I need to get, get things ready to go because I, I want to lead this, uh, th this nation. Uh, so he makes his preparations and he sees immediately that his first order of business after securing foreign support is that he needs to take out New England because th this is his vulnerable flank. Uh, and so right away, you have this regional skirmish between Burr's rump republic and the states that comprise New England. And it ends up with John Adams having to flee uh, Boston, very much like the British uh, had to flee in 1776 with the, uh, sure. with the siege, right? And, and he ends up going down to South Carolina uh, in the Charleston area. Uh, and very quickly, there becomes a, an alliance, first of convenience and necessity, but then I think it develops a little more between Thomas Jefferson, who's now the kind of the de facto leader of the South, and Adams, who's in exile with about 20,000 Bostonians down in South Carolina. 
Uh, and so this then allows us to kind of avoid the historical feud that developed between Adams and Jefferson. That never happens in this timeline. Yeah, well, and and, and I could even argue, and this is how I read it, uh, it, it fast forwards to uh, the final phase of their right. relationship, which, which which is almost a 20 year stretch in which they're um, uh, essentially friendly correspondence. With one yes, ab yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, this gives us an opportunity to see this relationship develop with them more closely uh, in, in terms of political equals and allies. And it also allows me to write about kind of two important strains of thought, because when when you think, aside from Burr, who I, I think a lot of this with Burr is just blind ambition, and he was a Democratic Republican. However, the leaders of the two parties after Washington were John Adams and, and, and Jefferson, and Jefferson yeah. right? And so then this allows us to have those two threads kind of working together in a more uh, fusion fusionist way than ended up happening in, in our, our real history. You, you mentioned it in passing, but I'd like you to explore a little bit more. Uh, you talk about Burr securing foreign support. Um, but one of the things that we actually see unfold in the novel is that the young United States uh, at least significant portions of it become essentially the cat's paw for European right. uh, intervention. Talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about the real world founders fear of that end. Right. So I think two of the founders, if I remember correctly, I think both Hamilton and Jay uh, wrote about the, you know, what will happen if you don't ratify this constitution. Uh, and they predicted that America would break into two or three different republics and that commercial republics are natural rivals of each other and that each would then seek support from European powers. Uh, they predicted uh, England, of course, France, um, Spain, right? Yeah. Uh, Netherlands, right? They would be jockeying for support from foreign powers to be able to protect themselves, not only from each other, but from other predations from other foreign powers. Uh, and that this would likely happen along the regional lines where you had sympathies that were already strong. Uh, and so for that reason, um, obviously, I mean, I think it's apparent to anybody that Burr's Republic uh, finds a friend in uh, France's Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, and it's quite a productive military alliance between the two of them. Well, more than productive. It reverses the outcome of the Seven Years' War. Basically. Right, yeah. right, exactly. So it's, again, spoilers, but if you're watching this talk, it's too late. Uh, look, look uh, that that's that that to me is is uh, one of the most compelling pieces of it. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk again. Uh, you know, this is rewinding perhaps fifteen minutes. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the horses uh, and your your historical research on them. One of the opening scenes of the book, uh, it's not the opening scene, but shortly thereafter, uh, you have the fast forward to 1804, and then you rewind to 1778 with the Battle of Monmouth, uh, which was a somewhat inconclusive um, in the real world, uh, a very hot uh, set piece battle between the Continentals in New Jersey and um uh, and and the british forces during the american revolution this is the highest and best use of new jersey by the way uh which is to a place to fight other people on um uh, to, to tell me a little it's it's a well-written battle scene uh and you can kind of feel just the heat and the grit and the difficulty endured by everyone who's participating in it uh i, I have to imagine you brought some of your real world army experience to that uh in addition to your research tell me about that well, first of all, this took a lot of effort to research because uh, I realized I didn't know a lot about, for example, the manual of arms for how do you load a flintlock and how do you fire it, right? So they had um, a, a huge number of steps that on the battlefield were condensed to, I think, eight or nine commands uh, when you were actually commanding people to, to uh, charge the weapon and to fire it. And so I had to get that down. And then I, I do own a muzzle-loading rifle. I think some people in the in, in the audience may have fired it. My dad and I built it from a kit around 1976. Uh, it's a 50 caliber. It's a beautiful weapon. Uh, but having a lot of familiarity. You have a muzzle-loading 50 cal? I do. I do. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, I've made, I, and I, I make I'll be, my I'll, be I'll be over on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so... So I have had some familiarity with how those weapons work. The, obviously, the one I have is probably about 50 years of technology more advanced because it has percussion caps. Not a, It's not a flintlock. But you have to learn, okay, so if you're a soldier, how do you operate this? What is it like? How many how many rounds can you put down, down range? How accurate is it? What's it like when you hear one of these, you know, 67 caliber 
balls fired from a British brown best smash into the sh shoulder of someone next to you. You know, this is a low velocity, but very large uh, uh, round weapon, right? That is going to be crushing bones and pulverizing flesh. And, and then, of course, you have the, the British who are extremely well trained in the bayonet charge. Uh, and so as you're trying to put rounds down range and frankly, only killing two or three people at a time, right? But you're demoralizing them. There, there's a lot of psychological aspect to it. And then you see the glint of the British bayonets come into view through the smoke of all of the, the low quality gunpowder that just puts out all the smoke and obscures your vision, depending on which way the wind is blowing. And you see the glint of these bayonets and you realize if they're a hundred yards away, it's about 15 seconds until you get that bayonet in your stomach and you're gone. Right. 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 And so all of these thoughts are going through your mind. And in the meantime, it's one of these terrible East coast, high humidity, hot days in the human body for every gallon of water you lose, you lose about 10% of your strength and you start to think less clearly. And so water is really important. How do you get water to the troops in the middle of all of this? And so, yeah, I've spent a lot of time at places like Fort Irwin, one valley over from Death Valley, where, you know, it'd be 124 degrees, literally. Uh, and you'd have to, you know, have your mop suit on, your, your, your chemical biological gear, right? And, and you'd, you'd have to drink through this little tube and in, in through your, your, uh, 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 and through your canteen. And oh, by the way, you have to do that like eight times in the day to get two gallons of water. Yeah. Right. So I had a lot of sympathy, a lot of empathy for what those troops were going through. And this was the first time the Continental Army in a stand up battle with the most professional military on the planet at the time was able to hold their ground and not be defeated, not run away. Right. So very important battle. And for this book, the reason one of the uh, lastly, one of the reasons why it's important is that when people go through the crucible of battle like that, they form lifelong bonds and friendships that will transcend almost everything. And that becomes important in later chapters as Burr is interacting with one of his troops that he commanded during that battle. You know, uh, one of the things that, that really comes out in the book uh, is this idea, you know, you're talking about the early United States breaking up into multiple nations, into multiple, uh, you know, contending republics. Um, and and you, you don't address it explicitly, but it's there. It's always present. Uh, this knowledge that the United States is a nation, uh, it's trite to say, it's a nation of states, it's a nation of regions with distinct heritage, distinct identity, distinct history. Um, tell me a little bit about that and the extent to which you see that being true today. Well, yeah, it certainly was true then. I think it's true today in a different sort of way, but very analogous. So uh, certainly uh, back at the time, you could argue that there were uh, four or five distinct uh, threads in America. Certainly you had uh, New England, where you had that Puritan influence, um, the Congregationalist mm -hmm. uh, idea. Then you had the 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 Mid Atlantic, where the Quakers dominated, and the, it was the area of commerce and industry, and and um, uh, and and then as you go further south, you had you know the Cavalier, uh, kind of the, the 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 British more elite uh, Anglican uh, Anglican yeah. uh, outlook, uh, and of course uh, spread throughout, um, you had uh, the, the this this new thread of of people that came in uh, mostly against their will, who in, ended up being slaves, mostly in the South. But by this time, not entirely. There was some, uh, as I recall, 20,000 slaves in New York uh, at this time. That's right. Uh, although they were employed differently, by and large, than they were in the South. Uh, they were mostly domestic servants and things like that. Uh, and then lastly, there was the, the people who were out on the frontier. And a lot of these individuals were people who had fled the political violence uh, as uh, the United Kingdom had become a more cohesive, unitary state. So we're talking about uh, the Scottish Highlanders and the, the Irish and, and others who, um, many of whom ended up going to Tennessee and obviously settling uh, sure. Texas. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, these were individuals who, you know, heaven help you if you tell them what they should do, uh, because... Uh, the best they could do is ignore you, but they're likely to punch you in the nose. Are you um, uh, are you going to write a sequel? 
Well, it depends on the audience, right? If, if we get a good reception, um, I've plotted out what the sequel might look like. Uh, and um, let, let me give you one example of how I think about this. So uh, in the book, uh, Aaron Burr, with the help of, of uh, Napoleon, ends up reconquering uh, Canada. Well, that has significant naval implications because the French at the time didn't have a lot of access to good timber. And they didn't even allow their timbers to cure. They were so, you know, their, their ships were probably going to be destroyed by the British pretty quickly anyway. So they went for volume. And as a result, if a French vessel lasted, the uh, planks would start to warp yeah. as the timbers began to cure. Well, what would have happened if Napoleonic France had access once again to the vast forests of North America? And even more importantly, what if they had a few of those American shipyards that built the Constitution class fast frigate? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Could you imagine if the combined French and Spanish fleets at Trafalgar in 1805 had a couple of those fast American frigates built to spec for them on hand at that battle? Well, maybe you might find out what will happen if I write the sequel, because that's going to be in it. You may be talking to the one guy who has imagined that. So that's... <laughs> You know, the, it's 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 interesting, uh, and again, I'll put this in the bucket of evidence that you're a real historian. Um, uh, one of the best straight history books on the American Revolution that's been written, uh, for my money, in the past 50 years is Rick Atkinson's The British Are Coming, which is the first in his planned trilogy on the revolution. And the book opens with an extensive discussion of British forestry management for the construction of, of naval vessels. It was that, I mean, I mean, you're, you're dead on with the importance. Well, it's of one yeah. of the reasons why the uh, Vermont flag has the uh, pine tree. That's right. It's directly connected to British naval uh, uh, material requirements. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I'll do that, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss you. We're, we're, we're almost at the point for audience Q and A. So, uh, you know, think of your questions, and uh, and also if you're online, you can type in questions. There's some window on 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 the YouTube uh, that you can do that with. Um, but uh, since you've thought about a sequel, and I know you have, yeah. tell me what happens to Texas in this alternate timeline. Oh my gosh. So Texas is mentioned in my notes. Um, I have at the very end of the book, I have a historical timeline and spoilers as to what actually happened. Uh, and I mentioned Texas because of course, uh, the uh, or original contingent of American settlers were brought in as a buffer uh, to help protect the uh, Spanish and Mexican settlements from the Comanche and from the other uh, raiding Native American tribes. Uh, and similarly, in, in my, my first book, uh, there ends up being a, a, um, a similar plan by Burr, where he has uh, escaped slaves that he gives a minimal amount of old equipment and training to, and sends them off into Ohio to serve as a buffer against the British-sponsored Native American tribes that are raiding. So, um, so yes, so Texas, of course, very quickly becomes an area of contention as the Spanish Empire starts to break apart. Sure. And so the the question is then going to become, you know, how quickly does that happen in the timeline for it to come into play? Uh, you know, you go out to 1813 when you had the Royalists, uh, where in Santa Ana was a lieutenant, uh, slaughter the 1300 Texians uh, right. who were trying to help uh, free uh, Northern Mexico and make it independent. So that, that 1813 event is probably at the very outer edge of my timeline. So it may give me the opportunity to have an alternative founding of the great state of Texas. I just want to make sure that it's still the greatest state, even in your alternate history. Oh, well, of course it's it will right. be. Fantastic. That goes without saying. Come on. Well, Chuck, thank you so much uh, for sitting through my questions. I want to open this up. We've got about 15 minutes uh, to uh, to ask audience questions now. Uh, if you're here, we do have some questions online that are coming in. So thank you for that. Uh, if you're here, raise your hand. We've got Erica. Oh, you're doing it anyway, aren't you? Look at you. Uh, Erica has a mic. So just wait for Erica to come with the mic. And my only request for you is make it a question. Anybody in here? Or shall I go directly to online? All right. Seeing none in here, you've got time to think of your questions. We do have some questions from online. Great. So thank you, uh, Anonymous, uh, online. Uh, what was your favorite discovery from the research process on the book? Oh, my gosh. Favorite discovery. Well, let me give you one um, delightful and unusual discovery. I found that there was this British admiral out of 
Rhode Island, who, when he had to evacuate as they lost the war and, and went back home, he had a, a personal slave that was his cook uh, from Guinea. Uh, and this cook's name, honest to God, was Cuffy Cockroach. And he was very famous for his turtle feast soups, uh, the turtle feasts that they they get these live turtles from from uh, the Caribbean. I, I honestly thought you had made that character up. And, and I really no, it's a real person. Okay. And, and they bring the, the turtle up in, in a barrel along with like limes and things like that. And they would make a feast out of this turtle that would go on into the wee hours of the morning. And the reason why he became, uh, you know, this outsized figure was that England had this law under common law that once you set uh, foot on English soil, you were free. There, there are no slaves in England, right? And so this admiral couldn't bring Cuffy back with him because he'd lose him. So he sold him. And so, uh, but, but just the, the thought of this guy who it was well known for being a cook in the region and who was a slave at the same time, right? When, when you think of, of Black contributions to American culture and society, and you think of all these implausible pathways that these things happen, that here was a guy that was well known enough that he, that, oh yeah, everyone knows about Cuffy Cockroach's, uh, you know, turtle feasts. Come on, right? It's a big deal. Uh, so that was an interesting, that was an interesting discovery. Um, I think some of the other things um, was just a, a reminder at how scarce hard currency was uh, at the time, you know, gold and silver. Um, and one of the things that that played into that, uh, which was I found very interesting, was that as the Congress printed a lot of continental dollars to try to fund the war effort, and you saw this huge inflation as they became worthless, I didn't know it, but it makes sense because the Union did this during the Civil War against the South. The British, of course, joined in counterfeiting continental dollars by the bushel full to help collapse the economy. And then, interestingly enough, after the war, they actually came to some arrangements to honor even the, the continentals that they counterfeited because it meant so much to them to get the American economy back up on its feet because it was so important to the British economy. And so one of the things I discovered was the vote franchise back then, every state had a requirement for property to vote of uh, varying levels of property. Uh, but generally speaking, you had to ha either own some degree of land or if you were a shop owner, have about 50 pounds sterling worth of property to qualify. Well, in some states, they actually enforced it in hard currency. But in other states that wanted to expand the franchise, they'd say, well, you can meet the 50 pound requirement in continentals, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, like pennies on the dollar of, of real wealth. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why we have the Electoral College and not a national popular vote, because places like New York, 300,000 people uh, during one of the gubernatorial elections, 6,200 people voted out of 300,000, because those yeah. were the men of property who were qualified to vote. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I'd be afraid, uh, you know, it's kind of a, an example of the descent from the founding era that Cuffy Cockroach is a renowned cook, and today he's more likely to be a, a lineman at Bojangles or something <laughs> like that. It's it's uh, so different. Um, who, who is, uh, any questions in the audience? Okay, I'll keep on going with our, our online. Oh, we do. Yes, please. The, wait, wait, wait. I work with you, so I get to reprimand you afterwards for not waiting for Erica. Go ahead. So of the uh, founding era folks that appear in the book, um, which one probably, I, I guess to use the term, closed themselves in the most glory in your story? Like who is who is the, uh, the most noble of the characters in your book that we would recognize from the founding era? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, you know, it's hard when you have people that are forced by circumstance, you know, basically having greatness thrust upon them, which I would say is certainly the circumstance with John Adams, right? He's, he's uh, subject to this offensive out of the blue from, from Burr, uh, ends up getting stuck in Boston, has to get rescued by the British fleet, you know, and then flees to the South. Um, but I'd say that um, uh, the Thomas Jefferson probably emerges as the most important non-Burr figure. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons why that's able to happen 
that would have been significantly more difficult as time went on uh, because of the nature of the economy. Uh, one of the things that struck me in my research was the significant change in the attitude of, of people in the South towards the institution of slavery that happened over about a 50-year period. And there were a number of reasons why that happened. So we went from a founding era when it was assumed that everyone knew it was an evil, uh, that it was something that they, that they inherited from the British Empire, that eventually it would go away. Uh, but then the practical issue is, well, how do you make this happen, right? Uh, you have an economy, you have people who who own a property and other humans. Uh, how do, you know practically speaking, how do you how do you terminate this? And so what what I found, which which for the purpose of the book was much more plausible in the timeline in which I have it occur than than later, is that there were a number of reasons why there was this hardening and rationalization in the South the revolution in Santo Domingo, what's now Haiti, uh, where you had several tens of thousands of European plantation owners slaughtered. Uh, and then you had two armies, both a, a British army and a French army, tens of thousands of people killed by disease and war, and the Haitians emerging with their independence, right? You had the, the, the invention of the cotton gin and the, and the introduction of a new strain of cotton that could be more widely planted that allowed the South to go from uh, a varied agriculture with tobacco and rice and indigo and cotton, probably a distant fourth, to a monoculture where cotton was at the top and it was worth a lot of money. And that shifted uh, attitudes. And then the reaction to the Haitian Revolution, where there were laws passed in the South that made it illegal to teach slaves how to read. That happened as the result of Haiti because the Haitian revolutionaries who successfully overthrew the French uh, colonial masters were all uh, uh, black. Uh, uh, many of them had been slaves, but some of them were blacksmiths. They were literate. They were people who either were self-taught or learned how to read. Those were the leaders of the revolution. And so many of the, the reaction to that in the South was, well, we can't have that happen. So let's prevent these individuals from, from learning how to read. Let's prevent them from working off the plantation. It was very common back in that era that you'd have slaves that would work as blacksmiths downtown, uh, completely off the, uh, you know, not, not on the plantation. That was all abolished as the result of a reaction to, to Haiti. And so as a result, it allows a character like Jefferson, who crafted the mission statement of the United States in the, in the preamble of the declaration, and people are like, well, how could he do that? He owned people. He owned slaves. How could he say that all men are created equal? Well, that phrase was taken directly by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and used as a promissory note that was written back then that he was going to cash now. And so that concept that all people are created equal was Jeffersonian. He, he was the guy that, that, that authored it. But then how do you enact it? How do you make it reality now that you're a politician and you're a leader and you're fighting against Aaron Burr and Napoleon's legions? How do you make that happen? Well, I'd argue that it was a much smaller lift to make that happen in 1804 and 1805 than it became in 1860. And, and so that then allowed me to have Jefferson kind of reach what I thought could be his full potential that as a victim of history and the timeline in which he was in, he was never really able to square his philosophy with reality. And so for me, it kind of allowed me to, to, to um, kind of rehabilitate kind of that last blot on Jefferson's um, philosophical character. Any other questions here in the auditorium? I think we have a, a hand up over on the exact opposite side. It's like a tennis match. Sorry, I just found out that Erica was a varsity athlete in a previous life. So, hey, hey, Chuck. Um, uh, so you touch about uh, political, the risk of political fragmentation uh, at the beginning. 
So in your view, what was the glue that uh, kept United States together in these early days? Well, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. So in my, in my book, the U.S. does not fracture until 1799. Uh, what happens in 1799? George Washington dies. And so um, what ends up happening is after a, uh, a, a crisis that occurs with Shays' Rebellion, with the response to Shays' Rebellion, and then the failure of the ratification of the Constitution, is that the anti-federalists led by the governor of New York and Aaron Burr try to address some of the really basic grievances uh, in relations between the states that led to the interest in, in ratifying the Constitution. So they're trying to tamp down on things and, and just kind of hold things together. Uh, and then what ends up happening is, is because the government that we were operating under with the, the Articles of Confederation was a very weak uh, central uh, government, uh, things uh, literally begin to fly apart when George Washington passes from the scene because he is the father of the nation that led us successfully through the Revolutionary War. When he's gone, that's it. There's just no more uh, reason to, to hang together. Uh, and so what ends up happening is you have both regional fissures that we talked about earlier about the different parts of the country that were, were settled by a preponderance of different people from the mother country. Uh, but also uh, a fissure between the the working people, the people without uh, land or capital, and the elites. Uh, and it's that fissure that Aaron Burr very uh, skillfully exploits uh, as a, a demagogue and as a skillful uh, employer of uh, propaganda. We have time for one short question and short answer. Is there any short question and short answers? One pequeño? Okay, no. All right. Oh, there we go. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Chuck. It was fascinating talk. And um, this is not directly related to history, but it's from your book. You mentioned that the horses back then could run 40 to 50 miles, whereas today they probably only run 20 miles because they're pampered and not. Um, so I wonder if there's some, you know, similar lessons that we can draw for our children today versus, you know, <laughs> what advice do you have um, to keep our children, you know, like the horses back then, so they could run 40, 50 miles? Oh, wow. Of course, when a horse went lame back then, they'd shoot it. Um, <laughs> it was a lot more motivating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have any kids that are teenagers anymore, so I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a fascinating question, because, of course, things are very different today than they are uh, uh, then, right? Child mortality was very high, although in the U.S. it was much lower than in European counterparts, um, because we, we've always been a, a, a pretty wealthy nation, even at our start, uh, because of the abundance of our of our shores and the and the uh, hard work of, of our people. Um, so, so when you look then at the challenges today with uh, social pressures and academics, obviously back then a lot of kids didn't interact with a lot of other kids. You know, you were out at a at a farm, uh, and and the nearest family may have been a mile or two away. Um, so, uh, that that's a, a fascinating question. I think the I think the most important thing for Americans to realize is that we put a lot of emphasis on material uh, goods in today's day and age. Uh, and between that and taxation, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to have uh, certainly two income families uh, whenever possible. Uh, and that has implications for children and, and for child rearing. And yes, it is a sacrifice to the extent if you're able to, uh, to, to not have to have, you know, two parents working full time. And I think that uh, that certainly is a um, also connects with back then, of course, where you didn't have factories, right? This is pre-industrialization. So parents are spending a lot of time with their kids relative to today. Of course, the kids were doing a lot of work as well. Um, obviously, they had to pull their weight around the household. Uh, so fascinating question. I just think that uh, uh, I guess if I were to summarize, I'd say that we need to understand that there's a trade-off between maybe having the, the most recent model of nice car 
and maybe being able to spend a few hours a week more with your children. How's that? Yeah, no, uh, wise words. I think it's indisputable that uh, TikTok and social media have made our horses today slow. And for, oh, anyway, maybe that's the wrong takeaway. Uh, Chuck, thank you for thank you for doing this. Um, uh, by the way, those of you who have joined us on social media, don't stop using social media, but uh, only when TPPF has a program on, please. I want to read you something from uh, the great uh, Sir Stephen Runciman's 1951 uh, History of the Crusades, a uh, fantastic book. And in, in his preface, he gives kind of an apologia for the fact that he, who is a, a moneyed, um, to his mind, academic nobody, uh, he did not end up that way. Uh, but simply somebody who is interested in the topic ends up writing this great work of synthesis, one of the great works of English language history in the 20th century. He writes, a single author cannot speak with the high authority of a panel of experts, but he may succeed in giving to his work an integrated and even epical quality that no composite volume can achieve. Homer, as well as Herodotus, was the father of history, as Gibbon, the greatest of our historians, was aware. And it is difficult, in spite of certain critics, to believe that Homer was a panel. History writing today has passed into an Alexandrian age where criticism has overpowered creation. Faced by the mountainous heap of the minutia of knowledge and awed by the watchful severity of his colleagues, the modern historian too often takes refuge in learned articles or narrowly specialized dissertations, small fortresses that are easy to defend from attack. His work can be of the highest value, but it is not an end in itself. I believe that the supreme duty of the historian is to write history, that is to say, to attempt to record in one sweeping sequence the greater events and movements that have swayed the destinies of man. The writer rash enough to make the attempt should never be criticized for his ambition. Chuck, you are a historian and you have had that ambition and you've written history in that spirit. And I thank you so much for being a friend and a patriot. Thank Appreciate you. it. We'll be uh, signing books outside. That's so. right. Book signing outside. Thank you all for coming.